Great. Okay, well, welcome everyone um, to our Sakai Faculty Showcase. Um, we're thrilled that you um, took the time this afternoon to um, spend with us and see a little bit about um, what faculty are doing with Sakai in their classrooms. I'm Wilma Hodges, I'm the Sakai Community Coordinator, and I'm also the Director of Training and E-Learning at Longsight. Um, so I'll be doing a very brief intro and then we'll hand it over to our, um, our faculty who are gonna share some best practices with you. Um, so first, um, let me just recap the agenda. So I'm gonna do, as I mentioned, about a five minute intro, um, keep it really brief, and then we'll have um, our faculty presentations, which will run about 30 minutes. Now, those are pre-recorded lightning round style um, presentations. So um, we're going to have the speakers, our speakers are actually here, and they're going to be in the chat answering questions during the video portion. We're also going to have a Q&A session at the end. So we'll have about 20 minutes or so to ask questions after um, the presentations run. So it'll be sort of like a panel discussion um, toward the end of the hour. And then we'll have about five minutes for wrap up and that should be um, for it for today. Now, um, just a few housekeeping details. We are recording the session and it will be available to view on the Sakai YouTube channel afterward. So you'll get a link to the recording and feel free to share that with, um, with any folks that you think might be interested. Um, we have turned on the auto captioning in Zoom. So that's been enabled and we also have the auto generated um, transcript, which you can click on. It's up in the, the top left area of the Zoom window um, if you'd like to view the transcript. Um, uh, during the session, feel free to, to enter questions and comments into the chat at any point during the presentation. Um, but please do keep your microphone muted and your camera turned off unless you're actively speaking uh, during the Q&A part because we don't want to uh, disrupt any of the, the video presentation. Um, so before we get going, I do want to run just a really quick poll. Let me uh, launch a quick poll here. You could take just a moment to let us know what your primary role is at your institution. That'll give us a better sense of who's attending today. And um, you know, if we do sessions similar to this in the future, we can you know, try to target things for, for the appropriate audience. So I'll give you just another minute to answer that poll. I see about 75% of you have voted. So we'll wait till that gets a little closer to 100. And you may have wear more than one hat at your institution. So if, if that's the case, um, just pick your primary role. All right, we're at 90%. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. And we'll share those results here. So you should be able to see that now. It looks like the majority of the people here are um, college or university faculty with um, college or university instructional design support folks as a you know, second runner up there. Um, looks like we have some administration folks, some IT folks, some people who are so special they can't be classified. <laughs> or other, and a little bit of vendor representation. So that's great. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, let me go ahead and stop sharing that poll. And so we should be back to our slides, correct? You're seeing my slides? If somebody could give me a, a yes in the chat just to make sure. Yes, we see still. the slides. Okay, great. Um, all right. So Really briefly, I know most of you here today are already familiar with Sakai, but we have been sort of uh, advertising this session far and wide. So we may have folks in the audience who are brand new to Sakai or are just sort of um, interested in what's going on, but maybe don't know too much about it. So I'm gonna take a couple of moments to um, just kind of hit on some of the highlights about Sakai as an LMS, and, and then we'll move into the, the bulk of our um, session. So first of all, Sakai is 100% open source, 
And um, that means that it's not only free to use and download, it's also free to modify and customize. Um, you can host it yourself. You can choose to host with a vendor that does the hosting for you. You can um, add code, contribute code to the community. You can change it up to suit your institution. So it's really built by the people using it. It's built by educators for educators. Um, so that's kind of a, a big um, message to take home as far as uh, where Sakai sits in the landscape, because that is different from a lot of the LMSs out there. Um, Sakai is award-winning. We have a, um, a, a company, it's called Software Reviews. It's a, an in independent third-party research company that does user-based reviews. And they've awarded us a number of um, you know, top awards for things like breadth of features, gradebook, online learning, student collaboration. Sakai consistently scores higher than some of the competition in those areas. And these are reviews by Sakai experts about Sakai um, compared to reviews from other experts and other LMSs about their LMS. So, um, so that's kind of where some of this data comes from, but we're very proud of our ranking in that um, space. Sakai is globally adopted. We do have more than 300 institutions and organizations using Sakai. It's difficult to get a, an accurate count because it is open source and anybody in the world can download it and run it themselves if they want. So they don't always tell us that they're running it, um, but we do know from the contacts in the community and with our various um, support providers that there's around 300 or more that are currently um, uh, Sakai adopters that are using it successfully for their um, pro programs. Um, Sakai ensures student privacy. So you can own your own data. It's, it's yours. It, it's not in the hands of some uh, company who may or may not choose to do uh, things with that data, sell the data, that sort of thing. So um, even if you choose a cloud hosted environment, your content, your student privacy is not a concern because it, it's yours. It, you can own it. And Sakai um, really takes student privacy to, as a, you know, a, a key um, factor. So um, we try to protect your, um, your right to your own data. Sakai 21, which is our current release, um, which was released uh, just this year, earlier this year, has some exciting new features. And um, some of these, this is just a, a very short snippet of what's available in, in Sakai 21, but we have a new dark mode. So if you like to use dark mode in low light environments, or you just prefer the you know light on dark contrast, that's an option now. We have a new dashboard tool, and there are a number of improvements in lessons, gradebook, rubrics, LTI, and, and lots of other good stuff. So I won't try to cover too much but um, I don't wanna take up too much time, but Sakai 21, if you've not seen it, um, has some really exciting stuff in it. And um, last but not least, Sakai facilitates best practices. So we have this rich tool set that supports teaching and learning. And we're gonna to hear today about how some of our faculty at Sakai institutions are using those tools to support their best practices. So we will hear from, um, Wilbur Reed about integrations. We'll hear from Michelle Mabry, Marissa Sullivan, and Monique Ridosh about course organization. Uh, we'll hear from Amy Dreves about online conversations, and we'll hear from Judith Eagle about peer teaching. So all of those exciting um, topics are coming up. And without further ado, I am going to stop sharing here so I can turn it over to Josh to play our video presentation. All right, hi all, Josh Wilson from, uh, from Longsite and from the Sakai community. Thanks all for being here. So I'm about to turn on the video presentation. It's gonna be about uh, 28 minutes or so. Uh, I welcome you all to raise whatever questions you'd like in the chat. And uh, I definitely encourage the faculty members who are here with us today to answer questions if they seem appropriate. Feel free to weigh in on someone else's question if you have an answer. So uh, we'll just keep this kind of light and, and informal as informal a, as a 40, 149 person Zoom can be. So let me turn on the screen sharing and we'll get the, the video started. And as Wilma mentioned afterward, we'll have plenty of time for questions. 
My name is Wilbur Reed and I teach at Johnson University. I spent about 27 years in the corporate world and then came over to academia in 2015 uh, when we started up an MBA program. And so the MBA program was fully online. And uh, so I got introduced into Sakai when we started with the, uh, uh, the, the programs and setting up the classes. Uh, use it uh, regularly in online classes, business courses. And uh, so whether it's leadership courses or analytics, uh, finance, those type of courses are the ones that I use Sakai for. So one of the biggest challenges in an online course is getting students engaged, to get them to discuss the material and what they've read and some back and forth. And so the tendency tends to be just to answer the question. If you just ask them a question and they'll answer the basics of the question, but they don't get into this back and forth discussion. We heard about this tool called Yellow Dig that allows the students to accumulate points. And so the more they post, the more points they get, and the professor can add accolades, uh, which are bonus points. So if you get a really good post, or you bring in external uh, sources, or use correct APA formatting, uh, so you can earn bonus points as you go. But one of the really interesting parts of it is that the students get basically free points when other people post on their discussion. And so the goal then is if you can put a discussion forum post in there that is early uh, in the process so that people have plenty of time to respond to it, but also that's interesting and engaging and prompts discussion, then you just get free points as everybody else adds on to it. And so the students then really focus on how can I create, how can I get other people to comment on my post? Uh, and so they put a little more thought into making it a discussion. And so we really like that idea. We brought that to our Sakai uh, guru and said, hey, we'd like to use this tool. And he said, no problem, I'll just add it in. What he was able to do is just take this external tool then and integrate it into Sakai so that the students don't even realize it's an external tool. And so to them, this is just, just part of Sakai. It's really worked well. It's, it's just integrated seamlessly in there and the students can use it. It works great for us. One of my favorite things about Sakai is the ability to bring in these external applications. And so to, to colleagues, I would say, you know, the, the limits of Sakai are only the limits of your imagination as far as, uh, and the tools that are out there, but, you know, being able to, to get in an additional tool and, and plug it in, whatever it is you need in the class, you can probably get it. There's probably somebody out there who has also had the same need and uh, has utilized that. So uh, I, I would say that uh, check into whatever it is that uh, you think you need and it'll probably work. I'm Michelle Mabry. I'm a professor of biology at Davis and Elkins College, and I've actually been using Sakai through the LAMP Consortium since 2006, both at Davis and Elkins College, and then I was at Lenore Ryan University for a couple of years with the shift to online classes last spring and this year with hybrid classes. Of course, I've really come to rely on Sakai a lot more. So I use it for content delivery. I post my lectures there asynchronously. I still do assignments using the uh, text matching service. Um, and then a big thing with my courses now is I organize all my content using the lessons tool in Sakai. So my favorite thing about the lessons tool is how easy it is to use. Uh, it's very intuitive setting up and selecting how you want it to look, what you want to use. And I guess the second thing, I'm doing two things. The second thing is, is it really helps keep the class organized, both on the faculty side of things and for the students. One thing that I heard from students 
basically all over the country is when we shifted to online, they were having to go to multiple different sites for their content. So they had to go to their LMS and then maybe an online homework. And then they were, you know, and then a video conferencing. So they were having trouble keeping track of where to go and when they had to go to those other sites. So using the lessons tool, I'm able to organize everything. Um, I do it by week. So I'll say, okay, this week, you know, we're, we're covering chapter five and you have this assignment due and here's an external video that supports the lecture. So it's, it's easy to use and it really helps organize the content well. What I have here is my Biology 309 class. This is Comparative Vertebrate Anatomy. If we go to the Lessons tool over here, it opens up all my weekly organization using the Lessons tool. And if we pick this week, okay. So I start off with just kind of a text block at the beginning saying, okay, this is what you have to do this week. So I say we're doing chapter nine in lecture. This is what we're doing in lab. And then I have a reminder that their next test is coming up and what's on it. And then if I scroll down a little bit, we can see this is where I post my lectures. So for me, lectures are asynchronous. And then I also posted a couple quick external videos that support the lecture. So we can see the links to those videos as we scroll down a little bit. And then if we go to the next week, again, I added that text block for, you know, here's what you have to do this week. So I'm, I'm reminding them they've got a test, when it is, what's on it, the lecture, the lab. Uh, I have a link to an external video for this one. And something that I also like here with this text box up at the top, you can add the student's name. So I kind of put little personalized messages, you know, little encouraging messages, and it will grab their names. So, I'll, you know, I'll tell students, oh, you're almost done, or, you know, don't forget about the test. Yeah, they, they definitely have told me that they liked this format. Uh, they say that it makes it really easy to find what they have to do for the week. Um, so, you know, there's no digging around for multiple sites, trying to remember, oh, you know, do I have an assignment due? When is the test? I've just found it to be very intuitive, very easy to use. Uh, it's, it's, and it's, it's very, it's a very powerful LMS. Um, there has been very few things that I've wanted to do that Sakai doesn't do. So everything I've wanted to do with my classes, Sakai, Sakai has allowed me to do that. My name is Marissa Sullivan. I'm a psychology instructor and chair of social sciences at Durham Technical Community College. I've been teaching for 10 years, nine of those have been teaching online, and for eight of those I've been using Sakai. I teach psychology courses. Most of my online courses are developmental psychology courses where students are studying the various aspects of human development from conception to death. And one of my unofficial learning outcomes in this course is the impact of culture and diversity within groups of people as we move through all these topics in human development. So students are assigned a country each semester and they have to research that country on these little mini assignments and this all culminates in an end of the semester project on death and dying rituals in their particular country. Now this is where student content pages comes into play. I use it um, as a vessel for them to present their research project. So students with this tool, it's really great because they can essentially build their own lessons page. So they have control over text, organization, 
So within this research project, they present information, they organize it, they can change the font, change the style, the organization of where things go, things like the column breaks, the section breaks. They can implement multimedia, things like pictures and different videos on this tool. And I do use this as an alternative to a traditional research paper. And I do get a better final product than I used to with just the presentation or just the paper. Um, because it's this very integrated assignment that has all these elements and because they're having fun doing it they want to learn more and so they go off and they actually research more than they need to and they really um, are surprised at how much they learn from each other as well. So I've received a lot of positive feedback from this assignment, com especially compared to when I used to do it as a present, just simply a in-class presentation or a research paper. Students report that they gain a more in-depth perspective of the topic, just death and dying in general, but also the role of culture. They have a much better understanding how it influences our development throughout the lifespan. And again, that's one of my unofficial learning outcomes that I want to really emphasize with these students. Uh, some other comments, some of the more common comments that I get is that it's interesting, it's engaging. Again, this helps with uh, retention and success rates. And finally, something that I often hear and really don't expect to hear and I'm still surprised is that it's fun. I would first make sure that you present clear and specific instructions for what you're expecting and what you want them to do, what the goal of the project is. I would also include a sample. Now I know the first time I did this, I made my own sample, which was a lot of work. Um, but And I have colleagues who don't do that. They just kind of let them go. Um, but students always like to see a sample. And I um, now in my classes, I use a sample from a previous student that they can view. And so they have a, a better idea of this looks like an A. Encourage creativity because and encourage them that this is their own. Um, I always tell my students, this project is your baby. You're assigned this country, but where you want to go with um, how you present the information, if there's a specific group you want to focus on, that's all up to you. Because, And that helps them with making, still keeping it interesting and engaging. Well, I've been using Sakai since um, 2012. Um, within a year of launching a fully online bachelor's option for nurses to complete their degree at Loyola University Chicago. We adapted Sakai as its learning management platform and um, I directed and taught in that program, typically engaging students in uh, learning about community health. Um, then fast forward to 2021, it has been a solution beyond what uh, originally was envisioned. Um, a central focus of the lesson page design is uh, the learner engagement uh, with the content, the instructor, and with peers. Um, the master sites are used in our RNGBSM program to ensure the consistency and the quality of the course design and delivery. There are several faculty who keep a master course site um, and use that for their course imports and to share ideas and strategies with other faculty. In my courses, I use lessons to build out my modules for the course, and each lesson is organized with an introduction, um, le learning objectives, content, and uh, activities as well. Typically, there's um, multiple sections of a course, so our, our faculty will use it as a template and then they will make it their own. For example, if they have any sort of lecture clips, um, they will uh, tend to either uh, use what's there or um, share their own uh, content from their own expertise as well, so it's optional. Um, Whenever I share my courses, faculty always welcome to uh, use my content as well. 
I wanted to uh, show you our um, Quality Matters course for the Concepts and Theories, um, which is, this is my master course site. I wanted to, in particular, show you this um, feature of Sakai, which I think is really useful for organization, of being able to create these subheadings underneath a module, so that makes it easy for students to access and go back to material. There is an example, there was an example here, let's go back, see, of the landing page I wanted to show you um, that has the subpages here, um, a checklist, and then a calendar and some support material. Here in this checklist, um, as a faculty, I can then uh, click and be able to um, view what a student has done. It'll show up as a check mark. I wanted to also show you from this module one of the subpages where I incorporate some imagery to elicit um, thoughts uh, about uh, concepts and um, before a student goes in to view a lecture. Um, I have them also add comments within the module. Um, to be able to create that um, learning community and have the students um, at large um, come together um, in this in this uh, online community. I don't grade those comments or those um, particular discussions that I create in the, within the modules. I have separate um, small group discussions for um, graded activities. I also integrate some activities where they have to do matching or they have to sort cards and embed those into the module pages. They comment on the structure of the course in my course evaluations um, on its organization and how interactive it is for online courses. Once you have a good template that is logically organized, you can build out your lessons and provide consistency for your students across the course. Um, it will facilitate both the learner and the teacher experience, and it's a place to interact and learn. You have that um, capability to tailor the content and create that space um, with the tools that you offer. So that makes it um, that makes it a very creative space. Hi, um, my name is Amy Dries. I'm the Composition and Literacy faculty at Northwest State Community College uh, in Archbold, Ohio. Um, I've been there for four years now, and Sakai is uh, their learning management system. So I've been in Sakai for four years, and really I've come to enjoy Sakai quite a bit. The course I'm going to be talking about is uh, Philosophy 210, which is Introduction to Ethics. The fundamental teaching challenge in ethics is that it is a highly sensitive subject and we're dealing with each other online. So our very first challenge is to establish what is the object we're studying and how can we approach it while respecting the student's internal expertise. Online, I have what they say to me and the order is not indicative of their comfort with the question necessarily. I have people who will do it, that answer the question on Monday because they're Monday people. <laughs> and then I'll have question, people who will answer the question on Monday because they're excited about it. And then I'll have people who answer the question on Friday because it's been a really busy week and they finally got around to it. So I have very little um, metadata on how this discussion is going to go online that I have automatically face-to-face. -face. Because it has to be written and they have to think, they're far more likely to curb their impulse to ad hominem argument. Um, but we also have directed, here's what we do and here's what we don't do in forums. And especially in the first two weeks, I'm very careful about sending private messages to students saying, you did a great job with X, Y, and Z. 
but I really like to see you not do um, personal discussion of people for whatever reason. Uh, and it tends to work out pretty well. So yes, it's a downside in asynchronous that it's hard to discuss and they don't want to discuss and the threading's a mess and da, da, da. there's a lot of complaints, but you have to look at it as I can set up every single student response and every student response to their peers in a guided way that would reflect the best possible day in my classroom. And that's what you have to think about when you go from one to the other. It still, it, it still feels like a lead balloon from time to time, but that's okay. <laughs> that's teaching. <laughs>。comments that I'm most proud of are comments that say, "I had to think about things that I had never thought about before, and it was okay." Um. I don't get as many of those, but those are the ones that I'm really looking for, because if one of the purposes of, of philosophy is to live the examined life, that's my feedback that my students have actually started the process of examination of themselves. First of all, all forums come with the same set of instructions wrapped into them. So within Sakai, I use the view extended description to have a set of forum guidelines that come with every set of questions. And those guidelines are highly structured about what time of week you're supposed to do this, what sort of answer you're supposed to give as far as length and structure, and how to respond to peers. So the very first thing is expectations are clear on the front end every single time. And it's not a, oh, you should remember this, go back to the syllabus. They have available to them right there every time they answer the question, what they should think about when answering a, a forum question. Then from there, I need to be in the forums as well with some level of direction and guidance. And for me, that is never saying, Johnny, you got the wrong answer. Here's the correct issue. It's a lot more of, Johnny, I think you and Maria really have something to talk about. Why don't you go read Maria's post and ask her about X, Y, or Z? When you build a forum, the tools you have are the questions you ask and the tone you take in your responses to others. Using those two, two tools is enough to have a really good, rich discussion you just have to be very patient about time and very directed in your responses. It's easy to misunderstand other people online. You have to keep the discussion flowing and topical and guided so that hurt feelings don't happen and you don't have people dropping out of the forum because they feel that they're unwanted in that space. I rubric grade all forums. It's the same rubric for every forum. I am not grading your knowledge of Socrates. For every forum, I am grading, did you engage with the question? Did you engage with your peers? And did you do this in a way that was respectful, timely, and vital to help keep the class spinning? And having that behavior grading in the rubric um, has done wonders for the kinds of forum responses and discussions I get. I'm Julie Beagle and I am currently teaching at the University of Dayton since 2014 and I am using Sakai ever since. I am teaching chemistry, specifically general chemistry and organic chemistry. I used to teach in person, and once the pandemic hit, I converted all my classes to um, online classes, and I've been teaching that way ever since. I am using a peer teaching experience, and um, to put that in an online format, 
Um, we're using the Commons tool for the students to post videos as they solve problems for the other students to, to watch these and learn from. And also I look at these as the instructor to identify if any students are um, struggling or are they on the right track, uh, kind of measure their progress. Every student does two of these videos per semester. I mean, peer teaching sh shown that um, it's very effective uh, learning because, uh, you know, a lot of people say you don't know it until you teach it. In the online environment, um, the, the video that they're recording, it's, um, it's either records them as they solve the problem or a lot of times they would have the, the problem pre-solved on a piece of paper and then would th they would just record explaining how they did it, why they did it, and why they did it that way. So here's our question in the first part for part A that we have to do is find the concentration of NOBR after 22 seconds. And to do this, we can use the equation for second order reactions to find this. So that's... One. So they don't only have the one or two examples that I pre-recorded as part of the, the, the module, the learning module, but they also have these extra problems where they can go back and they hear and saw the, the solutions too. And a lot of times when I watch it, I leave a comment too. Um, you know, especially if the, the video is very, very good, then I leave a comment saying, wow, this was really great. Please watch this for the rest of the class. Um, or if, if I find something that it's, that it's really, really needs to be addressed, that I address it in the comments for the other students also to see that, hey, this is what this person did, but we need to be careful because this and this needs to be done instead. Some of them do um, screen recording and they write on their, their screen, uh, which are usually the best quality ones. Some of them using their cell phones and trying to hold with one hand while they're writing with the other. Um, typically the ones that are using their cell phones are the ones that they do, uh, they work out the problem and then just do an explanation, which, which, which results in a better quality video. Um, and then um, they upload these videos to YouTube, which they have an instruction. So they have the YouTube account through the university. And they, they, I provide them with a set of instructions to make sure that these videos are not posted publicly. So it's just for the, for the class. And then they link this, this YouTube video into the comments tool. And I, I typically ask them to show the, the low picture. Um, so it's not just a link there. Um, and then they post it that way. You know, as you teach, start, start out, start it simple. Uh, don't put too much on the students and on yourself. And, and then just grow from there. See how it works and then tweak it. All right, that is the end of our video presentation. So let's turn to uh, some focus time for question and answers. And before I do that, I, I just wanna thank our, our faculty presenters. Thanks to each of you. Um, you guys put in a lot of, a lot of time pulling this together and, uh, and we really appreciate that you put yourselves and your, your techniques out there so that others can learn. So I thought that we might start the conversation uh, with questions around the topic of course organization for student success. So three of our presenters uh, took different approaches to this. And I'm curious uh, what questions folks would like to raise for our presenters around the lessons tool, around course organization, and around organization for student success.
So first question in the chat, will Sakai consider creating its own tutorial videos for different universities to use as part of training their own staff? Um, one of the challenges with Sakai as an open source platform that institutions can configure fairly extensively is that uh, no single set of videos uh, will necessarily address all of the learning needs across multiple institutions. So it's, it's definitely a challenge. Wilma Hodges leads our documentation team. Wilma, have you given this question any thought in the past? Yeah, I mean, we, there is certainly the desire to create sort of a library of videos. Um, the problem is always the time to create them. <laughs> By the time you get a batch of videos done, it's time for the next release and you have to go back and redo all the videos. And because we're an open source project and we don't have a lot of folks on the documentation team, um, that gets to be a little uh, too much sometimes, but we do plan to offer um, over the summer, and I was going to mention this as part of the wrap up, some lunch and learn sessions about some of the features in Sakai 21, the latest release. Um, and we will occasionally create feature videos around a certain um, piece of functionality. So we don't have a comprehensive library of videos, uh, but we do have uh, plans to offer some um, you know, webinar style uh, training sessions and also um, short videos on some of the more notable features. What other questions do you have? Um, sang -yun asks, I'd like to know roughly how much time our presenters spent to rebuild the lessons for their courses. Great question. So uh, so maybe, um, who, would, who would like to start us off? So let me let me do this. Uh, let me allow you guys to, uh, to unmute yourselves. And so then our instructors can either unmute themselves and respond or respond in the chat, whichever seems best to you. So how much time the presenters spent to rebuild the lessons for their courses? I'll go first. Um, I think it would depend on what you mean by rebuild. Because um, a lot of times when we rebuild our courses, we're restructuring things too. So in integrating new material, uh, I did a project recently and I will say, um, I spent a large number of hours rebuilding, but it was a big project. If you're just talking about reorganizing the information you have right now, just into a different format, um, I don't think it's too big of a project. Uh, Sakai is pretty user friendly in my experience and you can get stuff kind of in the more organized format in a quick way. Um, to tag on to that, uh, starting from bare walls in a course. So I have, say, a syllabus and um, my notes for teaching face-to-face. -face. I can tell you I've done uh, four of them in the last few years. And the first one probably took me um, 10 solid 40-hour weeks. And I'm getting better at it. So at this point, uh, when I have to estimate doing a class from... I just have notes and a syllabus. I'm estimating somewhere between 200 and 300 hours for that. And this is Michelle. Um, I actually was not using lessons in my Sakai courses pre-pandemic. And I found that I spent most of my time recording my asynchronous lectures setting up the lessons tool, adding everything in, that was pretty straightforward. So that for me at least wasn't too time consuming. And this is Monique from Loyola. Um, I, I think that, you know, it depends on um, how you're structuring your content. Um, I uh, in particular tried really hard in one of my courses this uh, last semester uh, to not use as much um, lecture and build in these uh, learning activities um, that included uh, a lot of reading on the page and um, and uh, matching and uh, just 
discussions um, and, and really thinking about how you can promote that active learning within the lessons page. And I think um, once you have a good template for those kinds of activities, not that you're gonna have that uh, particular activity in the same uh, format in, in, in weeks uh, back to back, but you can vary those activities and you can create templates to make that build out easier and less time consuming as you um, teach the course over and over again. To be honest, is like, are you ever done doing your, your lessons? So I started with a pretty bare one that I just posted like certain materials, um, like worksheets and then solutions. And, and, you know, I had the checklist and then I started adding to it stuff, you know, as, as we went and, you know, I get it into a high gear when we switch to online, of course. Um, and that was months and months, but I still don't feel that my lessons tool is perfect as I want it to be, you know? So I'm probably going to work on it for a couple more years until I feel like it's perfect. Judith, this is Monique again from Loyola. I never feel like I'm done. Um, I'm, I'm always tweaking. And I'm always updating. Um, I don't tend to like uh, textbook material as content. Uh, for for students, so I'm always trying to find uh, that latest article that says um, things better and uh, is up to date. So um, I don't think we're ever done. Um, I have to say, though, since I learned how to um, work off of these lessons uh, tool, things do seem to have a at least a structure that you can replicate and that not only you can follow as a faculty, but your students can also follow on, on a regular basis and just know, you know where to find the materials and not spend so much time trying to figure out um, the organization piece. Um, they know where to go. So there's a conversation going on in the chat right now about rubrics. Uh, started up by by Mary White with some some feedback from folks. I wonder if uh, if anyone has follow up questions or follow up comments about rubrics that they'd like to share. I'll share one quick tip with rubrics. This is Michelle maybe again. When you set up your rubric, depending on how you use them, there is an option to change individual grades, I think, I think it's called something like that. So if you have 10 points maximum for a category, if you wanna give them eight points or you know seven points, make sure you check that. Cause if you don't, then the default is basically you give them a zero or you give them 10. I hope that made sense. And Michelle, piggyback on that. Um, I love using the rubric feature and used to use them before we even had the feature. So I'm just so pleased in this last update that we can customize our own rubrics. And I also found that that was a very important setting um, that I had to go back and check um, so that I could individualize not only the points, but then also be able to add comments within each one of those uh, components of the rubric that I may have uh, scored lower uh, so that they understood um, what it was that, uh, that I was uh, evaluating them on. This is, this is Amy. Um, I, use con I use complicated textual rubrics. So I will often have um, five concept categories and every single one of them has absent developing um, adequate, good, and excellent. And then within those categories, there's an upper and lower point bound for each, um, for each section, and then extensive written comments underneath. 
Um, it really works well in Sakai's rubric system, which I've been grateful for because I've never found a quick and easy way to take the old style, here's a three page paper rubric and apply it in a digital area before. And the new rubrics tool lets me do that. It's been a great help, it sped up my grading. And um, I know Josh just asked me in the chat if I use rubrics. I have not implemented the rubrics tool in my courses yet. Um, I still have the old paper copies that I'm using. Um, it's just a, another Sakai project I need to work on um, and then just converting everything. But I do plan to use them um, very soon. But I've heard from colleagues they are super easy and really helpful. So I hear really positive things. Any other comments, thoughts, reactions about rubrics? Wilma, I don't know if you want to weigh in at all. Um, one thing that I just mentioned in the chat is that uh, there's a new option to have weighted criteria in your rubrics. So that's something that is uh, new in the upcoming, well, in the current release, the latest release. So um, if you have a need to use more percentage-based uh, grading, that can help with that. And um, you know, not unlike uh, some of the lessons that people feel like they're never done, Sakai is never done, right? So we're always tweaking and adding and, and improving. Um, so if there are features that you need for a specific purpose, you know, please, you know, communicate that to, um, to us so that we can try to work that into the roadmap and, and any of the um, improvements that are currently underway. This is probably a good moment just to mention that uh, we'd like very much to have uh, some faculty members in a, uh, in a user research pool that, uh, that we might consult from time to time. Super light lift. We may have a question every so often, uh, you know, because there are, there are situations in which it's just great to have uh, the views of a faculty member or multiple faculty members to help guide us. So we'll be reaching out a little bit later on to, uh, to ask those of you who are here today, if you would like to participate, it would be grateful if you would. So I went ahead and shared my slide for uh, the wrap up just because it has the uh, subscription URL. I've just set up um, a user research group in um, Google Groups. So it's an email list you can subscribe to. And uh, it'll be a very low volume list, as Josh mentioned. So you may, have, um, anyone who subscribes to that list, you may occasionally get an invitation to participate in a survey or a focus group or you know some user testing and that way you can provide your feedback directly to the team as we um, work on developing new features for Sakai. So I hope that you guys will take, um, take advantage of that because we really value your input quite a bit. So it's, it's 2.24 Eastern. We've got a couple of minutes left. Are there any other comments or questions that people would like to raise about rubrics before we move on to another topic? All right. Um, there is, uh, there's another question in the chat, which I, I I hesitate in some ways to take up at uh, at two twenty four with six minutes to go, but uh, but let's let's give it a shot. See if we can do it justice in the short amount of time we have remaining. So uh, Sarah Robinson asks, "We're using Teams and Sakai. Is there anyone doing this in an easy way?" What I can say is that there there isn't at the moment uh, a Teams integration with Sakai. Um, we're, we're we're looking into trying to add that in the future. So I why don't why don't we start by this? Uh, if folks are using Teams at your institution in academic settings, could you put a plus one in the chat? A fair amount of use. Can, I, can any of you uh, put a few words in the chat to explain how you use Teams in your courses? what kinds of uses you make?
So are, are teams used for, for student conversations? Um, you know, are they used for, for breakout groups? Are they used for in-class discussions? Are they used for, for live synchronous teaching or for lecture recording? Uh, Rob notes, instead of Zoom for live classes, Tiffany notes, most of our faculty using Teams have moved away from Sakai due to lack of integration. Video meetings, chatting with students, collaborative documents, project teams, chats. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious, uh, you know, is our teams mostly used for, uh, for live classes or mostly used for collaboration that's not in the live class? Yeah, I am, I, I am seeing both. Um, interesting, okay. So Sarah, is there is there a question that you wanna ask of this group of folks who use Teams? We have about three minutes and I'd love to get some feedback on the session itself, but I think we have time for a quick question and maybe a quick answer or two. Um, yeah, I was just, it kind of goes back to the having all these, the different places for information. And so, you know, just in a way to make it easier for the students and well, and me and other faculty to, um, yeah, I mean, it, that integration would be fabulous, of course. Um, it, it's just kind of trying to figure out a way to make those two work together, even if they're not working together yet. <laughs> That's my question, basically. We probably have time for uh, for maybe one response or maybe two. Does anyone want to uh, to take a stab at it? I'll take a stab at it. This is Christy Patty. I'm from Tennessee Wesley, and I am. I had a couple of faculty integrate or use the web content tool, so you can go to Teams and pull off the direct link to your Teams class that's over there, and place that in that left menu. And so, similar to what you saw with Yellow Dig, um, the students are able to jump right in there. Students are linked right into their Teams class if needed. Um, that's probably about the closest right now that you could get to having it uh, integrated, if you will, for now. But I do hope, like the others, that that is integrated soon. All right. It is 2.29. I want to be mindful of your time. Uh, it is our plan to end on time. So let me take the last minute we have here together and just ask you for some feedback about this session. Uh, I would love in the chat if each of you could post one thing that went well in this last hour one thing that was valuable for you and one thing that could be improved. So I would, if each of you could post one thing that was valuable and one thing that could be improved, that would be terrific feedback for us. I definitely see some comments in the chat about time. Yeah, time, time is definitely a challenge. And uh, one person noted that the, the chat box itself was a little overwhelming. And I, I do definitely hear you on that. So we will take a, a close look at the comments that you're putting in the chat and think about how to do sessions like this in the future and improve them if we can. This was a, this was a lot of fun for us. Uh, it was a non-trivial amount of time to, uh, to pull together the instructors and to do the, the video editing. Um, but all, on the other hand, we do have some, some really nice video assets and there's some, there's some outtakes that didn't make it into this session that we may share via video on social media. So if, you are, if you're not following our, uh, our various Sakai social media on Twitter, um, on Instagram, on Facebook, that would be a good thing to do. Wilma, does your slide include our social links? Um, actually, no, I don't think I... Well, actually, yeah, it does. So they're at the bottom. Hang on one second. So Just what I can do, we, we will send you all an email with a link to the recording uh, in a few days. And we can also include links to Sakai social media as well. So we'll, we'll, we'll send you a few additional resources so that you can uh, connect with us and see when there's, there's additional content that's coming out that might be useful. And we would welcome yeah, they're, they're any at the additional bottom. suggestions you have. They're a little small, but they're down there. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, for those of you with really good eyes or who are in full screen view, there you go. All right, it is 2.32, we're two minutes past time. I wanna break there. Thank you all for being here. This, this was a lot of fun. And uh, with any luck, we can do something like this again soon. So take care all, be well, and we'll be in touch with a link to the recording and a few other resources in the coming days. Yeah. Thanks everyone. Bye -bye.